The Alien movie from 1979 had gone through many changes when it comes to the script. When it finally was ready to be filmed, many drafts had been rewritten by various people over the years. I recently covered this topic with Dan O'Bannon's original script and how it changed when David Geiler and Walter Hill were involved. But for this video, I'm going to look at Alien, the original screenplay, and discuss a lot of things about the space jockey's evolution. This is a comic book adaptation of Dan O'Bannon's original Alien story before H.R. Giger, David Geiler, Ron Cobb, or Jean Garoud were involved. Jean was a French artist that went by the alias Mobius. He did some of the artwork for some drafts of the Alien script. If you saw my video about Star Beast, then you will notice some things that are similar in this video. The comic even says the story is based off the original name of the movie, which is Star Beast. So things like character names, the alien creature's design, and the structures on the planet are all going to appear different. The purpose of this comic book is to see the vision that Dan O'Bannon had created a long time ago. The story spanned over five issues and it was released from August to December of 2020. It was the last Aliens comic published by Dark Horse Comics before Disney and Marvel took over the franchise starting in 2021. Our story begins on the cargo spaceship Snark, the location far beyond Earth vicinity space. As the ship passes a nearby planet, a signal is picked up and the onboard machinery begins to awaken. The lids on the freezers which contain the sleeping crew has now opened up. We meet a few members by their names such as Roby, Broussard, Faust, Melkinus, Captain Standard and the ship's cat. The crew begins to scan their location. They don't recognize the constellation. Even sending out a call to air traffic control gets no response. Something's wrong. They weren't supposed to be here. They were expecting to have reached Earth by now, but they are far from it. The ship is now just short of Zeta-2 reticuli. It turns out they didn't even make it halfway to Earth yet. First Officer Roby would consult the ship's computer system. It explains what's going on. If certain conditions arise, the course voyage is interrupted. It's programmed to do so. It has intercepted a transmission of unknown origin. The transmission is recorded and played back for the crew. It only comes back as an unknown language. There's a possibility that it could be from an intelligent origin. To them, this would mean first contact. This could be the chance of a lifetime to be the first people to contact non-human intelligence. But the risk is undeniable. They don't know what's down there and contacting the exploration authorities would take them 75 years to get a reply back. And so, the team heads to the planet to investigate. Upon landing, they run into technical problems. The intakes were clogged with dust, and one cell was overheated and burned, and so, they begin the repairs immediately. It just so happens that they are only 300 meters from the source of the transmission, close enough to walk. Upon scanning the environment, they find the atmosphere is 10% argon, 85% nitrogen, 5% neon, some trace elements, and no microorganisms. It appears to be non-toxic but unbreathable. The planet shows no signs of life. It's just rock particles and dust. The size of the planet is only 120 kilometers in diameter. A team is then assembled for the exploration party. As they make their way through the terrain, they can't see more than three meters in any direction. They're walking on blind instruments. The signal starts to fade, but they eventually come across something. It appears to be a derelict spacecraft. Upon entering, their task is to find the control room. One large area requires the use of climbing gear, and up they go. Not far away, they find an object that looks like an urn or jar, it's open and empty. As they proceed forward, in the next room, they find something magnificent. What looks like the petrified body of an alien being sitting on a platform of obscure shape. They hear a sound, and one person draws their weapon, but they are quickly put at ease. 
it's just the machinery making the noise. And this is the source of the transmission. Their hopes for contact with intelligent life are quickly broken. It turns out the transmission they located is just a recorded message. However, the skeleton they found in the control room is still a significant find in the field of science. It is the single most important discovery in history. They have to go back to take more pictures and holograph everything. One theory is that this being landed on the planet to make repairs to the ship, something happened and it ended up being stranded. An SOS beacon was set up, but nobody came and they died. It's also speculated that this being was alone and not with others. One member of the team would continue scanning the horizon to see what it could pick up. And before their eyes, another structure appears. It looks like a pyramid. More speculation arises with this new discovery. Perhaps it's a marker for buried instrumentation or a mass grave. Or maybe a place where the rest of the crew are kept in suspended animation waiting to be rescued. As a team is sent out to the pyramid, their signal to the crew on the ship is lost. They are on their own. From a distance, it looks like there's no entrance. Maybe the entrance is buried, or perhaps there is no entrance. Back on the ship, the computer has managed to translate part of the transmission. It's not an SOS. In fact, it appears as a warning. Back at the pyramid, one member scales the wall. The structure isn't that large. When he reaches the top, a hole is present, which leads downward. Things seem to get worse. The transmission they picked up seems to have a warning message. The whole thing could not be translated, but parts of it read out like this. Hostile. Survival. Advise. Do not land. As Broussard goes down the shaft of the pyramid, he only plans to explore it for about 10 minutes. But as he goes deeper within, his signal gets cut off from too much interference. With their signal breaking up, the team on the ship has no way to warn them. They cannot spare the personnel to go out there, so they just have to sit and wait for them. As Broussard descends into the lower levels of the pyramid, he says, it feels like the tropics. Air is warm and humid, high oxygen content, no dust, it's completely breathable. When he reaches the bottom, what he sees is unbelievable. The walls were covered in hieroglyphs, like some kind of tomb that belonged to a primitive religion. Within this area, Broussard would find more things that look like urns or jars, like the one they found earlier on the ship, but these ones are sealed and soft to the touch. But when he touches it, some areas are then raised. They appear more organic and artificial. The inside is spongy and irregular. Just then, the creature within jumps out and latches onto Broussard's face. When the two members up top get no response from Broussard, they pull his body up. When they see him, they find some organism attached to his face. They try to remove it from his face, but it won't come off. His body is brought to the ship and despite Roby warning them of the quarantine procedures, she doesn't want to open the door, but is ordered to do so. Broussard's body is taken to the medical room to be examined. The creature has inserted some kind of tube down his throat. The crew is left wondering what's going on. First, it paralyzes Broussard, then it puts him into a coma and keeps him alive. The situation gets even more confusing as a heavy fluid is found within his lungs. They don't know if it's some kind of venom or poison, but it blocks out the MRI. A decision is then made. They have to do something to help Broussard. They make an incision and out pours this yellowish fluid from the wound. It spills onto the ground and smoke appears on contact. It's eating a hole in the floor. The smoke that emits from the burning effect seems to have some other properties to it. Breathing in the smoke is said to have a poisonous effect. As this liquid burns to the lower decks, the team follows it down, tracking it on each level. It just might burn through the hull. It's very potent, and they are unsure what they can put under it. Soon enough, it appears to have stopped. It fizzled out. The only substance close to this would be molecular acid, 
but this creature uses it for blood, which makes for a great defense mechanism. You don't dare kill it. The team would then analyze Broussard's data stick to see what he found within the pyramid. They assume the same thing happened to the creatures on the derelict spacecraft. These things may look like jars or artifacts, but they are actually eggs or spore casings. Another thing they look at are the hieroglyphs. It appears as a crude, symbolic language. Primitive pictorial languages are based on common objects in the environment. They could use this as a starting point for translation. The creature on Broussard's face is not the same as the spaceship, pyramid, and the giant being they found in the control room. They are all from different cultures. That ship just landed here, like they did. Maybe at one time this planet was not dead. Upon checking on Broussard, they notice the creature is no longer on his face. It's gone. The door was closed so it couldn't have escaped the room. The body of the creature is found later on and brought to the examining table. They look at the mouth, which is the organ or tube that goes down the victim's throat. It's a very unusual life form. Before they can get more data from this creature's body, it starts decomposing. They rush to open the main lock and toss it off the ship, before its acid blood could do any more damage. The team discuss the origins of the creature from the egg. It might be native to the planet, due to the atmosphere and dense gravity. The planet could have been fertile once, but that idea is ruled out from it being too small to support fauna as big as the parasites. Even the pyramid seems to have a lot of mystery behind it. It's too primitive to have been built by the space travelers. It is a pre-technological construction, possibly from an Iron Age culture at best. The spores were from the tomb. Who knows how long they've been down there. With the ship up and running again, they take off and plot a course for Earth. Meanwhile, they discuss what to do with Broussard's body. The best choice is to freeze him. He can receive medical attention back at the colonies. As for the rest of them, they should go into quarantine. But their plans take a turn when Broussard is seen to be awake. He is questioned about what he can remember, but it's all a blank to him. But he did have horrible dreams about smothering. Before the team goes back into the freezers for their long sleep, they enjoy one last meal together. During this time, Broussard feels intense pain in his chest. A creature then bursts out. Everyone watches in fear and shock. It was growing inside his body and he didn't even know it. The creature used him as an incubator. Nobody was able to capture it as it ran off quickly. Their plans to go back into the freezers for their deep sleep just got postponed. They have to get rid of the creature first, but its acid blood is harmful to the ship, so they have to capture it and eject it from the ship. Because of the limited amount of supplies they have on board the ship, they can only stay outside of suspended animation for a certain amount of time. With that in mind, they might have about a week's worth of supplies. Their plan now is to flush the creature out, room by room, and use the metalite netting to capture it, along with the use of electrical prods. One of them comes to realize all that space out there, and they are trapped inside the ship. Any signal they sent out would reach its destination long after they have passed away. They truly are on their own. With a weapon and net in hand, they also have a tracking device set up. It searches for moving objects. It doesn't have much range to it, but when you reach a certain distance, it starts beeping. Two teams are then made up. They would inspect the bridge to make sure it's safe. Then, systematically covering the ship, whoever finds the creature first should capture it and then eject it from the ship. One team is able to pick up something. The closer they go, the more the tracking device would beep. It's just within four meters. Get the net ready. Tensions are high. Everyone prepares. The door is opened and the net is thrown. But, to their disappointment, it was just the ship's cat. They release it and continue with their search. Meanwhile, the other team did get a look at the creature. It now looks different. It's more like a worm with legs and tentacles. They could try to pump poison gas into the same room, but that would spoil their food supplies. One idea they come up with is to have someone go inside the ventilator shaft 
and flush it out with a flamethrower. The rest of them would wait in the cooling unit with a net. Nobody volunteers to go inside, so they write an X on a piece of paper, crumble it up amongst a few others, and whoever gets that one is the one chosen to go inside. It just so happens that Hunter is the one to go in. He makes his way through as the areas behind him are sealed. He gets near the end and the creature is just near the exit. The other team prepares to make the final move, but something else comes out. A large creature appears. It's something new. They haven't seen it before. It leaps towards Melkinus, twists his head and rips it off. It then quickly jumps away and escapes. Everyone is shocked from what they just saw. The team would then look at the hieroglyphs once again. Maybe they can get more clues from it. The images they see appear as a pattern. They can see different forms of the creature they are dealing with. What they are looking at are the different stages of its life cycle. At least they found out that the flamethrower keeps the creature at bay. They are now low on fuel, so Faust would get more from the storage lockers. He's just advised to not go below the decks, and off he goes. Faust would come across the creature located in the main airlock below the lock. As the door is closed, the creature jumps out, and Faust is squished by the door as the airlock opens. Everyone starts to hear a loud warning message, critical decompression. As Roby makes it to the manual control, the creature is seen escaping again. And to make matters worse, their ship has lost a lot of oxygen. They only have six hours left. Time is running out. At first, they ponder the idea of blowing the ship up and escaping on the lifeboat, but there's another problem. The lifeboat can only support one person in the freezer to sleep. The other option is to leave N13 explosives on the lifeboat, push the creature into it, and eject it from the ship. But someone is going to have to act as bait to draw the creature into the lifeboat. To keep things fair, they use a method to decide who will get this dangerous task. And it seems like Roby is the one chosen this time. She is given the detonator to the explosives on the lifeboat. She is later seen at the lifeboat hatch controls. With only three of them remaining, they need to make use of their limited time. Shortly after, the other two survivors would get tracked by the creature. When they pick up something on the tracking device, they stop, but Hunter gets attacked from behind. Captain Standard turns around to see this happen. She quickly shoots a stream of flame in that direction, but the creature would use Hunter's body as a shield, avoiding any damage in the process. Roby would later find the body of Captain Standard, cocooned up against the wall and barely able to speak. Standard would say this, That was Melkinus. It ate Hunter. Roby wants to help, but it's too late. Standard suffered too many injuries. She wants the pain to end. Roby would fulfill her wish and lights her on fire. Roby ran out of time to turn the cooling units back on. It's gone past the stage of being stopped. The core has begun to melt and the engines will overload soon. She has to escape on the lifeboat. When she reaches the lifeboat, the hatch has been open, but she has to go forward. Within the lifeboat, she wonders where the creature is. There's no time to think about it. She has to hurry. With seconds left to spare, she detaches the lifeboat from the Snark spaceship. She feels the aftershock of the explosion. A sense of relief comes over her. She thinks it's over, but it's not. A sound is heard nearby, and it's the creature. It snuck onto the lifeboat with her. She catches a glimpse of it. A feeling of dread and fear overtake her, so she rushes to another area. Roby suits up and pulls out a spear-like weapon. Opening the door, she throws the spear. It pierces through the body of the creature. It shrieks as Robbie runs towards something. She pushes a button to open the airlock. A decompression warning is heard and the creature gets pulled back. If she can just hold on a little longer, it would almost be over. As the door starts to close, the creature is pulled away from the ship and into space. But part of its tail gets cut off when the door shuts. Robbie reaches out to enable the ramjets. It fires up and the creature is incinerated. What's left of its body then floats into the endless abyss of space. Despite losing the entire ship and its cargo, Roby did manage to salvage something. Perhaps this item would prove to others that she's not crazy, and other intelligent life is out there. 
She and the cat will then sleep the rest of the way home. It might take some time, but at least she's safe. This is Martine Roby, Executive Officer, last survivor of the commercial vessel Snark, signing off. There were different covers to the five issues of the comic book. The alien had a slightly larger head, increased body mass, and the textures on its tail were different. There was also a comic book about Predator, the original screenplay. It was going to be published by Dark Horse Comics, but since that franchise is also now owned by Disney and Marvel in 2021, it was cancelled. Maybe it's because there wasn't enough time to finish every issue in 2020. Because we are on the topic of the original Alien script, I'm going to bring up some information about the space jockey. According to an article on WordPress, they have some history about the space jockey's evolution. Originally, the pilot on that device was going to be a mere explorer that stumbled upon the planetoid. They would come across the pyramid and its deadly spore. But in Dan O'Bannon's version, they were a space-going race that landed on the planet. Their species were wiped out by whatever was there. Now the people from Earth find this planet and put themselves in danger trying to find out what happened. The pilot would then serve as a warning to the audience that something about the pyramid and its contents were deadly. The aliens on this planet were indigenous and required host bodies to birth their young. In the film version, the pilot was a victim of its own cargo, eggs that house parasitic alien spore. When the script was being rewritten by David Geiler and Walter Hill, they ended up removing the space jockey as an alien entity and replaced it with a downed human pilot. The ship was recognized by Dallas as a L-52. The xenomorph creature was also said to be a product of the company's bioweapons division. The term space jockey was not its original name. If we look at the original script by Dan O'Bannon, it's described as a huge alien skeleton, but in one version by Geiler and Hill, it's changed to have the figure of a human being terribly disfigured. A bit further down this draft, you will see that Dallas says this, one dead space jockey, no sign of other crew members. The old L-52s generally went up with a complement of seven. The term space jockey is a spin of desk jockey, which is a definition of someone who sits at a desk and does office work. Since the filmmakers were trying to give the feeling that space travel was unglamorous, perhaps even boring, so the name Space Jockey just seemed to fit. It's also inspired by a short story written by Robert A. Heinlein in 1947. It was called Space Jockey. It's about a rocket pilot who pilots a commercial passenger spacecraft. It travels between the Earth and the Moon. Different artists would try to create the design for the space jockey. Chris Fodd did come up with a version of the jockey's head. This would fit into Dan O'Bannon's script, where the crew would return to the ship with the head of the jockey's skull. Another one, drawn up by Ron Cobb, took on a smaller frame. It had a small jawbone, no large teeth, no mandibles or any of the other things. In the end, it just seemed like a non-violent herbivorous creature. Mobius drew one version of the space jockey as well. It laid out the idea of a large being on a mechanical platform, but it just wasn't the right version they were looking for. One version of Ridley's drawings showed the space jockey looking like a flight suit that had become a chrysalis for a moth or butterfly. At one point, they would even describe the space jockey wearing a suit because it resembled scuba gear. Ridley Scott would then take a piece from H.R. Giger while it was not exactly what they wanted, it did serve as a starting point, and from there, it grew over time with adjustments to bits and pieces. The one they built for the set ended up being biomechanical. It was to the extent that which it appeared to be physically grown into or out of it. He's integrated totally into the function he performs. Ridley Scott goes on to say, I wanted almost a fossil one which you'd have a hard time deciding where he leaves off the chair on which he died. That one scene cost them half a million dollars. At first, the studio was not going to allow it, but later they agreed to it. With concerns to the budget, the studio said this one time, this is not your main set. You're just gonna have to walk by and see a skeletal imprint in the mud of this 15 foot creature and then you'll walk into this strange looking building.
Even H.R. Giger had some words to say about the space jockey. I modeled it myself in clay. It was then cast in polyester. I worked particularly on the head and I painted it. To make the pieces of skin, I put on some latex and then scrubbed it off, then painted some more. If we had more days, we could have made it better, but I think for the film, it's okay. The source on WordPress says that the space jockey miniature prop was destroyed by fire set by vandals, but over on the website imdb.com, it says the prop was destroyed by a cigarette left on the model. At one point, there was an idea about the space jockey. It was seen as a military pilot delivering the alien eggs. These were used as a bioweapon in some interstellar war. This ended up being something that Ridley Scott would later encourage. He saw the space jockey as the driver of the craft, and the eggs are the cargo. Perhaps one of the eggs got disturbed and the creature got out. This matches up to when they always wanted the space jockey to have a damaged chest area, giving the connection that something had burst out of its chest. There was a time when the pilot was removed from the platform it's on and placed into the landscape. The team would not see it until they viewed it on the recorder back on the Nostromo. When viewing the footage later on, the crew would freeze frame one spot and see the shadow skull of the space jockey. So that covers a lot of information about the original Alien script by Dan O'Bannon and some other notes about the space jockey and how it changed over time. If you enjoyed this video, leave a like rating on it. I'll be doing more videos like this in the future, so make sure you subscribe to my channel and turn on the bell notification. You can also find me on Twitter and Instagram, so follow me on those platforms. If there's anything you want to add, just put it within the comment section. Thank you for watching, this is Carlos or Acid Glow, and I'll see you in the next video.